Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. Nothing but nothing replaces live dancing. What does this inspire to you? What is the thing that strikes you? She's one of the most important writers of the 20th century. Today on Spotlight, creating opportunities and bonding over art. How this mural celebrates the area. Plus, a new book honoring one of the most famous and most misunderstood poets. And then, what to expect this season at Dance St. Louis. Why you'll want to get tickets to these shows. But first, a pioneering African-American military pilot from St. Louis. It's Sunday, and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award-winning Spotlight. Every year, Americans celebrate Veterans Day. But did you know since 1944, St. Louis has set aside one day to honor one soldier in particular. December 12th is Wendell Oliver Pruitt Day. The name may sound familiar, but who was the man behind it? And why was he so celebrated for decades? Pruitt was part of the first black flying unit known as the Tuskegee Airmen. They were a distinguished group who enlisted in the Army Air Corps Cadet Flying Program in 1941 and trained in Tuskegee, Alabama. Well, he's from St. Louis. He came from the Ville. That's where he was brought up, and he came from a family of 10. Wendell was the youngest of Elijah and Melanie Pruitt's large brood. Born in 1920, he attended Sumner High School and briefly studied at what is now Harris Stowe State University. He transferred to Lincoln University in Jefferson City, known in the 1940s as the Black Harvard of the Midwest, and where military traditions run deep. He was a member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. He was well liked by his peers. I mean, there were several articles, you know, after his passing, you know, people reminiscent about him and very popular on campus. At the time, Lincoln University was one of three black colleges that conducted civil pilot training and is the institution that laid the foundation for Pruitt's career. And he only had like a month and a half to go to finish his degree, but he he heeded the call like a lot of other young men did on this campus. And it was just amazing how they uh, sacrificed themselves for their country. Prue was already a licensed pilot when he enlisted. Just two years earlier, blacks were not allowed to fly until President Roosevelt relented under pressure and ordered the civilian pilot training program. Pruitt's red tail plane was christened Alice Joe after his fiance. This display downtown at Soldiers Memorial History Museum pictures Pruitt handing a ring over for safekeeping. That ring was left with his mechanic or the young man that took care of his airplane every time he went on a mission. Known to be a quiet man, Pruitt's fellow airmen describe him as being fierce in the air. He was credited with shooting down three enemy planes and destroying eight others on the ground. But it was what happened flying over the Adriatic Sea in the Mediterranean when Pruitt and his wingman, Lieutenant Lee Archer, earned the moniker, the gruesome twosome. He'd pull ahead and I'd pull right behind him and try to stay on him. He was a heck of a pilot. And just staying there sometime was a full-time job. With no bomber or torpedoes on board, Pruitt had sunk a German destroyer the size of a football field using only machine guns. One of those bullets hit all that ammunition on deck and what should have been a small boom became a big boom. That ship was so damaged that it would have to be scuttled. And he is the only one in history, since, before and after, that has got credit for sinking a German ship with a 50 caliber bullet. That was in 1944, and in December, St. Louis welcomed home their decorated hero. Posters were put up all over the city. A parade was planned, but cold weather forced the celebration inside City Hall. His niece, Judith Pruitt, proudly recalls this picture of her mother Vesta and grandmother Melanie attending the ceremony with then-Mayor Aloysius Kaufman. Some of the uh, people that knew him that said when he visited the schools and everything, he was so kind and quiet, and but never into self at all. Yeah. To me, is to, to me the most important thing. 
I like his humbleness. Captain Pruitt told his family he was anxious to return to action flying over Europe, but his transfer was delayed due to the death of President Roosevelt. Instead, he was sent back to Tuskegee to instruct new fighter pilots. The last time he came back, he told my mother, he said, um, these airplanes are really bad news because they gave them the worst airplanes, you know, just kind of junk, but they flew them. And he said, when, when he goes up in the air, it feels like he's flying in a casket. Those were prophetic words. In April 1945, Captain Pruitt took a student up in a trainer plane. It crashed and both were killed. Pruitt was only 24 years old. Judith doesn't have many mementos of her famous uncle and cherishes a letter a neighborhood friend sent to his mother back in 1945. I was of course sorry to hear of Wendell's death and it's indeed too bad that his army career had to end up like that. I suppose though, that's a pilot sticking to that kind of business for such a long period. But St. Louis would not forget their hero. In the 1950s, his name, along with local congressman William Igo, was lent to the ill-fated federal housing project called Pruitt Igo. In 1984, the Pruitt Military Academy was established, but is now known as the Pruitt Charter School. And in 2007, President George Bush awarded all Tuskegee Airmen the Congressional Gold Medal, which Judith proudly keeps. And to further her uncle's legacy, Judith and her mother helped raise money for a mural by local artist Solomon Thurman, which celebrates the history of black Americans in flight. Anyone passing through Terminal 1 at Lambert Airport can spot Captain Pruitt, his wingman, and the red tail fighter plane. Captain Wendell Oliver Pruitt is buried at St. Peter's Cemetery in Normandy, Missouri. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Enter the chilly no man's land at precisely five o'clock in the morning. The no color void with a waking head rubbishes out the draggled lot of sulfurous dreamscapes and obscure lunar conundrums which seemed when dreamed to mean so profoundly much. Gets ready to Sylvia Plath is one of the 20th century's most famous poets and perhaps one of the most misunderstood. Her marriage to poet Ted Hughes and her suicide often overshadow the importance of her innovative writing, work that transformed American and British literature. In the biography Red Comet, author Heather Clark moves beyond stereotypes to paint a portrait of Plath as a complex woman and ambitious poet. I just wanted to, I hope, give a, a richer and more accurate picture of the, the woman that she was, the writer that she was, and the, the obstacles that she had to overcome to achieve what she did. Red Comet is a comprehensive and compassionate account of the short and vibrant life of a brilliant, trailblazing writer. You had published a previous book on Plath. What made you want to write this one, Red Comet? You know, my biography, believe it or not, is the 11th biography of Sylvia Plath. And so one thing that kept coming up when I was thinking about writing this book and when I had just started out was this question of, of why, why another biography of Sylvia mm -hmm. Plath, right? Um, and I, I asked myself that <laughs> many times and other people would ask me that. And there was always this sort of edge of skepticism, um, maybe quite deep skepticism of what's the point. And, and my answer is that, well, first of all, there had not been a kind of, I, I thought, long, serious, in-depth, critical biography of Sylvia Plath. So, so all of them were on the shorter side. I mean, much shorter, like 300 pages or so, um, which is fine. I mean, that I, I have no problem with short biographies, but I just felt like, you know, she really deserved that, that doorstopper. And I felt that she'd been pathologized uh, in the past on television and movies and even past biographies as, as this sort of um, cliche of the death obsessed writer or the hysterical woman writer. Um, I felt like she was better known for the manner in which she died almost than for her uh, trailblazing poetry. She knew she wanted to write from the time she was eight years old. She published her first poem. She was, she was sort of a child prodigy in the sense that she could write in these almost perfect metrical forms, you know, from a very young age. And she would 
she would write sort of complex poems when she was age 11, age 12. So she always knew that was the direction she wanted to go in. But of course, she lived in this society where women were second class citizens, um, you know, sort of legally and socially. A picture emerges of a very assertive woman who's like, I'm going to assert my way in the world. And that totally blows the mythology of her as this damaged, depressive heading towards suicide every day of her life sort of person. It wasn't that way at all. Yeah, and, and I'm glad to hear you say that because if, if I had a goal, you know, in writing the, <laughs> this book, that was it. Just sort of changing our perception of, of Sylvia Plath and, and not reading her life backwards, right? From as if, as if, as if every act was, was an act towards suicide mm-hmm. um, and sort of, concentrating on her commitment to art and not death. She's one of the most important writers of the 20th century. I mean, not not just one of the most important women writers, she's just one of the most influential and innovative poets, especially. Scan the QR code on your screen with your phone's camera to watch the full interview and find out what she discovered in Platt's poems that gave her a new view of the poet or just head to hecmedia.org. background as an artist is I am a photographer and I also like to I make things with my hands I make sculptures jewelry I paint I graduated from architecture school in Colombia but I was always interested in color and te- art techniques so I have been since 2012 an artist you know when I started my career when I started business uh, in my family art was not uh, considered a career. It was a hobby. So when I moved to San Luis, I, I decided to, to do my art career. I've always been interested through my work to highlight the need for representation and the need to understand migration as a human need, especially in today's state. All four of the artists that are working on this project, we all belong to this group of artists in St. Louis called Latinx Art Network. The Latinx Arts Network is a group of Hispanic or Latinx artists and artist allies. The purpose of the group is to support each other um, and also help create opportunities for our artists and our arts community. Yes, we formed our our committee in one of the Latinx meetings. We were talking about things that we wanted to do, uh, and somebody brought up that they would like a mural, and I think it sparked all of our interests. What inspired the mural? There was some a narrative on the news about children separated from parents in the, at the border. We felt that we want to do something uh, to change this stereotype of the, you know, the immigrants and people at the border. Through the mural, I intended to make a child, a female child, be important and take center stage. Our girl is an Afro-Latin uh, looking at the sky and looking for hope. That's why we have a blue, bright sky. We introduced items, for example, African baskets, which were very much aware of the African culture being a predecessor of all of our cultures in Latin America. When we got the location of Del Mar, uh, we were aware of the you know, African-American community. So we included the baskets because um, we want to do honor the, the area. We also have a flower that is native to Missouri. Yeah. I always feel that flower 
signifies uh, the cycle of life and the beauty and to know that the beauty is not forever and you go to the earth again and then you reborn again. We include some papel picado, which is very typical from Mexico. It's very festive, it looks like fiesta. We include the, the trolley is there. It's kind of, because it's kind of fun. People can take a picture, you know, trying to get into the trolley and San Luis Arc, those two elements. Um, kind of to make, you know, like this, the stamp, the muralist in San Luis. One of the characteristics of both the iguana and the monarch butterfly, both species that are able to adapt to different situations, different weathers, different uh, environments. So we thought, how about that? Because we have those species in our countries and they reflect on that ability to blend in, ability to live in different environments. We had so much feedback. People, everybody that walked by was always telling, oh, that's beautiful. Uh, thank you for doing it. One guy in particular said that he loved the fact that the girl in the mural was of darker skin, you know? He loved that, and he said, because he doesn't see that ever. We hope that the community will continue to feel embraced by the message of the mural and that they will stop by and take photographs, take their children, their students, and basically have a conversation. What does this inspire to you? How do you see it? What What is the thing that strikes you? No matter how different we are or how diverse we are, it's always something that brings us together. I think it's a some level of loving life, uh, happiness. I, it's always colorful. Like I say, por amor al arte, por the love of art. The Town & Country Symphony celebrates Christmas later on Spotlight. As this season started, we presented the third annual Evening of Ballet Stars. And we are moving forward with the rest of our season. That includes Tango Argentina, which will be performed in February of this coming year. And then the gentlemen of Troc, the Ballet Trocaderos, will show up in April. And we will conclude our season with the ever popular Spring to Dance Festival. The Evening of Ballet Stars that just took place is one of those events that I inherited before I became the artistic director. And it's very complicated because you have to deal with nine or 10 different artists. And throughout the year of pandemic, there was a lot of changes that took place to do it. And the whole point was to try to create a quality show second to none, and that we would have artists that our audiences here would clamor for. And in that regard, we succeeded in every step of the way. It was an event where nine different dancers kept the audience on their feet all the time. So it was fabulous. we focus on trying to bring is something that nobody else does in town. So Tango Argentina offers a perspective of what might be considered popular dancing, but it's done with style and with incredible live music. And then the Ballet Trox is a great company. It's a company of only male dancers that have been in existence for 40 years. And for some reason or another, Dan San Luis never brought them to town, yet they're world renowned. So we are definitely making sure that we don't make that mistake anymore. I believe that live performances cannot be replaced and I feel that dance is one of those things that you cannot keep in, the, in, a, in a closet. You know, you can't keep it and then 50 years from now you will discover, oh, this guy was a genius. You know, a composer can put all the stuff there and maybe it works. A painter stays there all the time. An actor might have the same problem, but film is developed in such a manner that can capture the acting in a different way. Dance is still developing and sometimes it's very hard, even for those of us who are dance lovers, to sit through a one hour dance film. For me, it doesn't translate it with the vivacity and the passion and the clarity that live performances have. And for the audience, I'm sure it's the same. Nothing but nothing replaces live dancing. Make sure you take the time to get into the Dance and Lewis website and discover exactly while we're performing and when the tickets can be found because it is something incredible. You see it live, you come out a different person. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. 
arts and education, to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements, to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hcmedia.org. This is what's known as Build Day. Eight years ago, Steve McLean heard about a unique volunteer opportunity where he could put his woodworking skills to good use. Sleep in Heavenly Peace is an organization that makes uh, beds for kids, simply put. But there was a problem. The nearest chapter was in Kansas City. And I thought, gosh darn it, why aren't there somebody here in St. Louis with a chapter? And as soon as I said that, I thought, uh, actually, why don't I build, <laughs> start a chapter here in St. Louis? He enlisted the help of fellow members at Arlington United Methodist Church in Bridgeton. The need in the St. Louis region is great. Roughly 26,000 children do not have beds. We just cannot understand the effect that having a bed can be for someone in, a, in their rest, in their psych, you know, psychology, any of those things. They develop better when they have basic comforts, basic needs met. And so we have communities where people, they don't have beds. Children do not have beds. We get to tangibly give them these things. We get to be a part of that. I really enjoy it. Volunteer Terry Lasico has been part of several builds. It's a good thing for me to get out and feel like I'm participating in something important for my community. The best part, she says, is delivering the beds. I admire the fact that people are out there struggling to do everything they can to make things work and have the bravery to call them and say, I need a hand. So if I can be the hand, I want to be the hand. And on a cool, crisp fall afternoon, a connection as volunteers arrive at this North County home. I was so happy. I was so excited. Hannah Jones called Sleep in Heavenly Peace asking for bunk beds for her older children, ages 11, 7, and 4-year-old twins. The kids had all been sleeping together on a mattress on the floor. They stayed up later because they're fighting because one that they touching each other, which made them be cranky in the mornings. Volunteers came in and put the bunks together. The new beds included new mattresses, sheets, pillows, and comforters for the little ones. Hannah surprised her children later that day and shared video of their excitement. Do you like that bed? Thank you. Thank you, Mommy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody, to the organization, to the volunteers for coming to put the beds together, for helping me help them. We appreciate it. It's the smiling faces of both parents and children that keep volunteers motivated. Between the Alton and St. Louis chapters, hundreds of children have new beds. We do not require any experience. Organizers say any adult and older child can volunteer. On this day, volunteers from the Way Church in Wentzville helped with the build. One of the nice things about the way they set up the builds is they break it down into very simple tasks. We can show you what you need to do in about five minutes, and the experience level goes from people that actually do construction and, and woodworking down to people who've never picked up a drill before. Companies, churches, and other groups can sponsor a build and provide volunteers as well. Right now there's a waiting list of about 50 beds. We have delivered to kids that don't even know what a bed is. We were hauling stuff into their homes and they thought they were going to get a mattress to lay on the floor. That was to them what bed was. They had no idea what the wood was for, what all the pillows and all that. They didn't know. And so the excitement that you see on their faces and the relief you see on the parents' faces is, um, is very rewarding. And, and that's really why we do this, is for the kids. When people receive the things that they need, they grow. They grow physically, spiritually, emotionally, everything. It just, it's better. And so being able to do something like this, this tangible act of, hey, here, um, it just helps exponentially in ways that I think we don't even find out until later when these, when these young children have grown. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight.
next week. They call her the Jewish Santa, why she helps thousands of local kids. Plus, the Vox Society returns to live shows. We'll take you to one. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.